Father, we thank you, Lord, that you, you are with us here, that you are in us. You said, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. And we can await your word, whatever it is. We can stand on that word, and we can move forward in the power of that word. So, Father, we give you all the glory in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I want to talk today about the river of God. Uh, a second title might be Keys to Victory in this walk with the Lord. You know, for myself, and each one of you can stand in my place, for myself, I would say, I am walking toward heaven. And the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, is walking right next to me all the way. I don't make this walk alone. He's with me. Each one of us are walking closer and closer toward the heavenly places. And one day, each one of us will be there. We don't know. It could be tomorrow. It could be tonight. We do not know when that time will come. Anybody, we do not want know. I, I know, I do am hope praying that mine is at least another 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> that, there you go. That, that might be just a wee bit far, but uh, at least another 20 years okay. of that. Okay. Uh, because I know it's going to be past 100. I, it was prophesied over in, uh, in India. And uh, I have to tell you something funny before we go to the Word of God. That brought to mind, I'm sure it's the Holy Spirit, <laughs> that um, something that happened. I'm on a Zoom call with other pastors uh, every Friday morning at 9 o'clock. Now, I am the only woman that they have on the, on the Zoom call. So that tells you something to begin with. Well, there aren't many women pastors up here. That's what one of the things it says. But, but um, so I don't say very much. I, I just kind of am in the background, which is where maybe they want me. I don't know. But I'm kind of, but I'm kind of quiet, believe it or not. And um, yes, I am. <laughs> but uh, uh, so when we, when we were in India, Marcy and I, the two brothers that run the ministry, there's a huge ministry in India. We were going from place to place, and and I've told this story before. But when we were, but one of the one of the the brothers, the big man, his name is Sastri. He's four times the size of me, and he, he we were at his house, and we were waiting to have lunch. I think it was they were going to celebrate my birthday or something, and and he said, "Mama Don, you are not a woman." <laughs> okay. Now. I couldn't get offended because I knew what he meant. Yeah. What he meant was a what he meant was a compliment, and because there weren't any women pastors there that we found, uh, and so he, he just said, "You are not a woman." I love that. That was just a that just that just blessed me in so many ways. So then he said. Um, he went in the bedroom, he was going to change clothes and get dressed up for my birthday or something. He came back out and he said, Mama Don, the Holy Spirit just told me something. You are going to live till you are 99. Okay. And he turned and went back in the bedroom, came back out and said, wait. <laughs> that, I have a correction. It's 105. <laughs> All right, praise the Lord. <laughs> So we'll see if that prophecy is true or not. Um, see, I'd still be traveling to spread the word. So this morning, I want to talk about this path that we're on. Revelation 22, verse 1. And he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for all the words that you give us. I thank you for the word that we can open in front of us, Lord, that you have brought for us. So, Father, this morning I pray that you open your word to each one of us. Give us revelation. Speak into our heart and into our spirit, Lord. Speak into where we are right now. Each one of us in a little different place than the ones before. Even though I believe we're all in this gathering and moving swiftly through this tunnel. Thank you, Lord. And he showed me a river of the water of life. And the Greek word for life is zoe, Z-O-E, referring to the principle of life in the spirit and soul. The principle of life. 
oh, I thought, what did I do? <laughs> Spirit of life. Okay, expressing all of the highest and the best which Christ is and which he gives to us, to the saints. The highest blessedness of the saints. That's what Christ gives to us through the Holy Spirit that the Father sent us. So, rivers. How many ever get on a river very much? Raise your hand. How many, how many have spent time like maybe on the Colorado River and run the rapids or something? Done anything like that? Yes, okay, praise God. And it's, so was that a thrill? Oh yes. Was it frightening at all? At moments. Yes, <laughs> those are moments. <laughs> you know, uh, was it, were there times that you were in a kind of a quiet, peaceful place and just felt beautiful? That's what God does with us. Mm -hmm. That's what happens when we're in the river. When we're in the river of the flow of the Holy Spirit. So, John 14, 26. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to you remembrance all that I said to you. We, I would not want to be without the Holy Spirit. I cannot imagine being without the Holy Spirit. But we can learn from him and he will remind us of scripture and remind us of things that he has done. The life of a Christian is best known by the river of God running through it. Amen. Now think about that for just a minute. Exactly. Best known by the river of God running through it. Is there just a trickle? Is there anything running through it? Or is there a waterfall coming through it where the Holy Spirit is moving in power and intensity? The life of a Christian led by the Holy Spirit. And so let's talk about just the body of Christ before we actually go to this. We Western Christians are kind of spoiled. When Marcy and I travel and you see some of the things that we see, uh, <laughs> it just popped in my mind, between, beside, beside kids that are, need a little bit more food to eat, not starving children, but just children that need a little bit more to eat. But then we have the nature around us and, and we have, uh, and we have any, you have to kind of watch where you're going, where, where you might walk, and they say, oh, that's a scorpion. That's the biggest scorpion I've ever seen. It's the high size of a car. <laughs> that may be a slight exaggeration, but, but you know, I, I, I'm, I've seen little scorpions, and that's not so bad, but the really big ones are really <coughs> something else, and we're often in those kind of places. So we, we as Christians here in America are really spoiled, I'm sorry. Yes. We, we have so much here. Yes. That when, when we go wherever we're going, I don't know sometimes what we're eating. I know what I think it might be, but. <laughs> <laughs> and so they were gonna treat us really special in uh, Rwanda one year. They are gonna make special things for their guests. And we were sitting at the head table where everybody's watching you. And they brought soup to us. <laughs> Smells pretty good. Looks good, you know. And it had something in it. I couldn't tell exactly what was in it, but whatever was in it, I couldn't cut it anyway. And so I finally managed to get a little piece of it and put it in my mouth and smiled, you know, because everybody's watching to see what you're going to do. <laughs> and I put it in my mouth and I wanted to get it out of my mouth as soon as I possibly could without making a scene. It was the worst thing I've ever put into my mouth. <laughs> I didn't want it to come too soon. But I, I finally kind of got my mouth covered and managed to get it out of my mouth. And I just, I said, what, what is this soup made of? <laughs> Stomach. <laughs> Stomach. The lining of the stomach. That's just like rubber. Okay, so there, you never know, but this was a delicacy for them. So, so I did what I could. <laughs> Some things are just too hard. You know, sometimes, sometimes they've asked me on occasion to, to select the food that I want, which happens to right at the moment be walking around the building on four legs, <laughs> several of them, and they want me to pick one that, that they would butcher and we would eat. And since I used to raise goats, I was pretty good at picking out a goat. So I'd go pick out a goat, and it would come over, bah, bah, and I'd pet it and pet it, and I'd eat it. <laughs> a few hours later. So 
We want, we kind of like the smooth uh, <coughs> life that we lead, generally speaking, of culture. We like to be comfortable in, oh, maybe an old beanbag chair, leather beanbag chair that moves, and, and we don't really want to get out of it too easily. It's slow, it's soft, it's virtually impossible to get out of the older you get. But <laughs> we don't want to walk through any deep water because that's a little bit scary. We don't want to walk through any valley. We want to be on the mountaintop as much as possible, or at least on the side of a hill. Rivers through valleys give life. And it's rich in the valley because the rivers run through the valleys. But we think of the valley as a dark time, a dark place, and we've all been there at some time or another. But we like to see things from the mountaintop. We get that big panoramic view of what's going on. Yeah, but in the valleys, we live it. In the valleys, the valleys are where farms get plowed, babies get born, the dead are buried. Valleys can be dry gulches or they can be uh, just rich with the minerals that come with the water that flows through the valleys. They could, we can be in what seems like a terrifying desert or wide, rich plains where the grass is growing so beautifully. That's our walk through life. That's a part of where God has called us. Peaceful or frightening, jungle swamps, grassy plains, valleys are the cradle of life. So the next time you find yourself in what you consider a valley, a low place, a not place you definitely prefer to be in, just think of it as a place where God does his most in you. Life and all of it is a gift from God. Mm -hmm. Every part of it that we live in, the highs, the lows, the concerns, the worries, the fears, the threats that come from without all the time. Life is to be lived. Mountain peak or valley is to be lived. That's where we live, in the joyful knowledge that an unfettered God is the God of all, God of the mountaintop and God of the valley. And in every experience you have, no matter what's going on, no matter how difficult it gets, no matter what the fear is that might try to rise up in front of you, God is in it all the time. We think sometimes if we get fearful over something, God, God, where are you? He's right there. He never left. If anybody moved, you did. Right. So he's there. We cannot see from a profoundly limited viewpoint everything that's going on. Sometimes we don't even know that God is there, except we know his word. He said he'd never leave us or forsake us. But we can't see him, and we can't feel him, and we cannot depend on feelings. I've heard had people say, come up and paralyze, say, I just don't feel God anymore. Well, just because you don't feel him doesn't mean he isn't there. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you, we need to learn to walk without feeling mm -hmm. that God is there, but knowing that God is there. Yeah. That's the difference wow. through it all. Yeah. Through it all. Uh, all that God is working out in these dark places, in the valley. And even, I hate to say this, what he's working out in you <laughs> or in me. Because sometimes that's the most work he has to do <laughs> in you, you, not me. You see, he's always working on you. He's always taking away and giving something in its place. Sometimes the things he's trying to take away, we don't want to give up. We want to hang on to it. We want to hold on to it. We don't want to give it up. So we cannot see. There's a day that's spoken of in Romans 10 verses 9 through 11, and then 13. There's a day when we confessed with our mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believed in our heart that God raised him from the dead, and we were saved. That day is the beginning. For with the heart a man believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. Amen. For the scripture says, quote, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. That's a definite. It doesn't say it may not be disappointed. It should be okay. It says will not if we believe in him. If we truly believe in him, even in the valley, even in the worst time, even when things just don't look that good. When we wonder, where is God? And then in verse 13, for whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Will be saved. Whoever. 
whoever, doesn't matter where you've been, doesn't matter what you've done, doesn't matter how tall you are, how short you are, how heavy you are, <clears throat> how thin you are, or anything. It just means whoever you are, you'll be saved. Doesn't matter what you've done. Doesn't matter the sin that you've committed. Doesn't matter the sin that you might have committed this morning that you didn't mean to do. Verse 13, the Lord points out that whoever drinks of this water, that he's talking then about any worldly water, anything that we may drink so that we can get satisfied with the feelings we want, the taste we want, we will thirst again. We cannot satisfy our thirst by the water of the world. But whoever drinks of the water from Christ, which is God in Christ, as the flowing Holy Spirit, will never thirst again. Amen. Even more, even more, this water will become, in the one who drinks, a fountain of water gushing into us into eternal life and leading other people into eternal life. Now that's exciting. Yes. That's exciting. But sometimes we get caught in that valley and we just can't seem to get out of it. We can't seem to get, what is the problem, Lord? Why, why, why are things working the way they're working? Why can't I move forward? But then we don't stop to listen to what he says. We just run off. So when I ask sometimes somebody, do, have you talked to the Lord this morning? Yep. Oh, well, good, good. You want to share with me what you talked about? Oh, so they tell me what they talked about. And what I hear from what they tell me is, yes, they talked to the Lord, but he never got to get a word in that twice. <laughs> they just kept talking. And then I said, oh, by the way, thank you, Lord. Amen. <laughs> How many of you know that you've been known to do that on occasion? I am. Yeah. Well, if you're honest, you probably all have it sometimes. You've got to be quiet. Amen. And just listen to what the Lord says. I was sitting in my, my library, which is where I do my, my devotions, my reading, my study. Uh, and one day, and this is many years ago, and I happened to be sitting looking out the window and just pondering the scripture I had just read. And a bluebird landed on my on our feeder out there. Now, you know, if you, some of you may see bluebirds a lot. I don't, where we happen to live. We just don't seem to have bluebirds. But there was a bluebird, beautiful. And I think that the color was multiplied in its intensity because, because the Lord put that bluebird bird there. Amen. And I couldn't get over how beautiful it was. It was something new. I say that. It was something new I hadn't seen. And I heard God say, as I said that in my mind, God said, there's a new thing coming. You see, he'll speak to us in nature. Yes. He'll speak to us by uh, billboards. I, I'm going to tell you this now. He'll even speak to you through somebody you don't care much for. <laughs> and sometimes that's the hardest. Because you don't want to believe that. But that's what he does. So we have to listen. Always hear, where is the Holy Spirit now? So, um, now, this this whiteboard. God always has a high purpose for taking us wherever he takes us. Are you following with me? He has a higher purpose. He has a purpose in all of it. And men, much of it he's teaching us while we're walking through it. So uh, let's look more closely at what it means to step into the living water. The river of the Holy Spirit, who leads us through the rest of our lives as we listen and are obedient and do what he tells us to do. So I have drawn here, uh, I have drawn here, right up here, and I, I'm sorry, this is, I don't win awards for artwork either, <laughs> among other things, but this is where the river starts for us when we come through the river, and it starts at the cross of Christ. It starts when we give our life to the Lord, when we recognize who he is, when we recognize he is the creator of the world, and the creator of the world, Jesus Christ, is in us. Amen. I mean, he can do anything. Expect miracles when you come to Christ. Expect divinely orchestrated meetings that he can, that he can bring to play. And so we, we get on that, we get into that river, and we, we immerse ourselves in that river. This river is flowing beautifully at this point. Of course, we don't have a clue at this point what it means to walk with the Holy Spirit. We don't have a clue then. 
<laughs> Some of us are just now catching on. So, but then, oh, oh see then, uh, sometimes we run into some problems when we're walking. Anybody here not run into a problem when you, as you've walked with the Holy Spirit? <laughs> Anybody here not run into a problem? I am convinced that the Holy Spirit looks for the first problem he can find <laughs> to put us into the middle of so that we can learn about the Holy Spirit and learn to listen, learn to listen to what he has asked us to do. So, um, so these, these lines right here, you know in a river there are rapids. Ever been in, in a boat going through rapids? It's very, it can be, depending on the rapids, it can be pretty scary. But the key to victory in the rapids, it's just that things are happening, you don't even know what's happening. In fact, you wonder, what am I saved? Even, it's because sometimes. So the first thing you have to do is, I'm just calling it unshackle God. Don't make God do, don't try to make God do what you think ought to happen now. Don't start giving the Holy Spirit direction on how to run, get through this. The hardest proposition for many Christians today is to accept, to accept, is that God may ever, for any reason, lead you out of a safe, beautiful place into rapids. But God does. Into the rapids of the river, to struggle, pain. He, an unshakable God is who you are walking with. Unchain him from your demands of wall-to-wall -wall blessings. Unchain him from trying to make him do what makes you feel good. Unchain him from what you think your life will be. You see, for a long time, I didn't unchain him because uh, that was when I still knew that God did not call me to pastor a church. <laughs> That's about uh, 30 years ago. Uh, so I was still telling him what to do, and I also knew for sure that God did not call me to missions. <laughs> That's for other people. And when they would come in, when the mission people, the teams would come in and they'd give their testimonies and, and they would talk about how great things would happen, I'd go out to the lobby and drink coffee. <laughs> it was kind of boring. <laughs> I, I had him shackled pretty tight. But you know, I don't care how tight you try to shackle God, how much you try to keep him tied to what you think he's going to do in your life. He has a way of getting free. <laughs> Just on his own. And so, um, Unchain him from your demands of wall to wall blessings. Embrace the rapids that time when you embrace them when they come, and come they will. Can anybody say amen? Amen. amen. All right. That is authentic life. <clears throat> so we say, well, we don't want to go through rapids, we don't want to go through this or that, or the other thing. Well, are, do you want to live? Mm -hmm. This is life. Have you read this book? And so when people come to me and they say, they maybe sitting down counseling in my office and they say, well, you, I'm the way I am because my mother ate pickles or whatever, <laughs> whatever it may be. Or I come from a dysfunctional family. What is a dysfunctional family? Um, because I have learned over the last many years that if you read this book, all the dysfunctional families are in here. <laughs> Dysfunctional is normal. <laughs> Hello. So don't use it as an excuse to why you are the way you are. Amen. It, you can't use it as an excuse anymore because you are not how you used to be. You have Christ in you now. Amen. You have Christ in you. Amen. So there's a story. This is a true story of a young minister in the hospital. He had just been told that his right leg it had to be amputated. You would expect that he had that you'd have to comfort him since he would have a sea of questions about the right, the rightness of things. But instead, he embraced the rapids with a hope and good humor. Really, he said, this is great. This is great. I always wanted to be the best preacher in the district, and I could never make it, make it. And now I think I have a really good shot at being the best one of a preacher with only one leg. <laughs> now that's now that's embracing life, isn't it? That's embracing life. Number two, listen to God. Listen to God. Joshua 10, verse 8. And the Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear them, but I have given them into your hands. Not one of them shall stand before you. And the Lord told me many long years ago 
No matter what Satan tried to do to me, he had no power, he had no control. And you know, we blame a lot of problems in our life on Satan. When maybe it wasn't Satan, maybe it's something that you've done to walk yourself into the position that it now seems like Satan must be attacking. Satan certainly does attack, but he gets more blame than he deserves sometimes, I think. Circumstances. Voices, other voices telling you what you should be doing, telling you why, why are you doing this or that or the other thing? And so I have circumstances here. The river doesn't look very bad because I'm not a good artist, but circumstances start to come into play. Uh, you've gone through the rapids, you think, oh, phew, well, that's over. And then other things start to happen. People begin to ask, you pray. Seems simple and safe, doesn't it? Of course, the first place we picked was Belfast. <laughs> and that was at the time that there was the troubles of Belfast. All kinds of killing, all kinds of shooting when England was coming in, all kinds of fighting back and forth. And that's where we were, in Belfast. Not a very safe place to be. And people said to me, before I went, why are you going to Belfast to pray? Because that's where God told us to go pray. And then the next question is, well, why can't you pray here in the United States? I didn't even have an answer for that, except, well, God told us to go to Belfast. He, we, at that point, we weren't shooting people yet. Now that's changed, but I'd rather go over there and pray, thank you. Okay. Oh, God, I didn't say that. <laughs> Circumstances, voices, distractions begin to come in and ask you what you're doing. Maybe you came home and you told your family, guess what I did? I accepted Christ today. And they said, you did what? Accepted Christ today? Well, don't talk to us about that. And some people have had that all over the world. But don't let that stop you. The most strenuous of all theological discipline has to be in balance. An unbalanced emphasis on personal faith can lead to dangerous Gnostic self-worship that elevates my own faith to the throne and leaves an active God out of the picture. Such an error believes in miracles but puts my hand or tongue on the contacts, on the controls. Unbelief does not balance faith, it dilutes it. It's when you can't believe in miracles. You can't believe that God would do that or do this. Unbelief that he would lead me into any issues of problems or trouble. It's not going to be glorious all the rest of your life now with Jesus Christ. It will be glorious because you're with Jesus Christ, but it's not going to be easy. There will be times that you say, I thought this was going to be much different than how it really is. It, but you find out you're walking through life. The thing is, you're not going by yourself. Amen. You're walking through life with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Many an eager but immature saint has mounted off, up and ridden off in all directions after coming to the Lord. The key to Joshua's uncompromised faith was a clear word from God. Hearing is a key element. Number three, when you hear a direction from the Holy Spirit, <coughs> do it as quickly as you can and as specifically as possible. Had, having heard from God that victory was his, Joshua did not wait for it to come to him. He got up and went to it. Sometimes when I'm in different churches or praying someplace for people and, and they'll tell me that God told them this or that was going to happen or they were going to travel all over places and I'd say, well, what are you doing to prepare for it? I'm waiting, they say, I'm waiting. What are you waiting for? I'm waiting for God to take me. No, no, no. You have to prepare for if whatever God told you, there's preparation. Amen. Don't just sit and wait till something happens. That's right. Make it happen. Do something. Uh, so Joshua obeyed quickly, energetically, completely. All too frequently, sincere believers have genuinely heard from God, but they just camp right where they are and wait for something to happen. But it's far more likely to sit staring at the sky, as did the disciples at the ascension. Jesus, what did he told them just before he ascended? Go into all the world. So what did they do? Stare at him going up into the heaven. I suppose, I mean, I, I can't argue with them. I've probably done the same thing. Thinking, where are you going? Why are you going? Promising to be with them and 
To return to glory is what Jesus had done. And after he rose through the clouds, they still stood staring until God noticed the problem and sent angels to break it up. The promise of victory is usually followed by a command to attack. Then, of course, sometimes we run into uh, a sudden turn. You think you, you think you have all figured out now what God has called you to, and then there's a sudden turn. It's like, well, wait a minute. We were headed that direction. Now there's this turn. And where are we going in the turn? Well, the river turned. You have to stay with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is changing, moving, turning. So we have to stay with the Holy Spirit. Don't leave the Holy Spirit. And so then there's confusion sometimes. We get confused about what are, what are we supposed to do? I thought we were supposed to do this. I thought I was supposed to do that. And we're confused in what we think, we may think, that God is telling us to do. And then, oh, hate this, to get into the swamp. Of course, all of us are walking in the swamp in America today. <laughs> and we're in that swamp right now. And what do, we what do we find in the swamp? Tell me, what do you find in swamps? Turmoil. Turmoil. What else? Sin. What? Sin. Sin. What else? Death. What? Death. Death in the swamp. That stinks in the swamp. What else? Muck. Muck. Just ju mud. Muck in a swamp. What else? Corrupt people. Yeah. Snakes and alligators. Snakes and Not going to go political. Okay. <laughs> yes, corrupt. Well, there's animals and bugs in the swamp. It's a bad place to be. Okay. All right. Not, not the world swamp. This swamp. It's, it's got all those things. Those corrupt politicians stink, and it's stinking in the swamp. Okay. Anything else? Any, it, it, society doing what it will do without the leadership of God. Right. Society doing, and that's what happens in a swamp. You know, depending on what part of the country we're in, in a swamp. Let's go to, let's go to Africa. Let's go to, uh, let's go to uh, <coughs> Phoenix. Let's go to where there are creatures in the swamp that will eat you. What? Bloods, blood suckers. Okay, we're gonna end this now. <laughs> a loss of direction. It's hard to get to the swamp because often we we lose our direction. First of all, we're not sure how we got there. Yeah. Maybe we think we do, but we're not sure. But secondly, how do we get out of it? Yeah. It's cool. Would anybody? Uh, no, don't say it. <laughs> uh, and we're confused about things. And a loss of direction. The swamp. So what happens in the swamp? Number four. What? Bad stuff. Bad stuff. I think of Trent. Those are bad, bad people. <laughs> so, face reality. Face reality. Don't deny what is happening. Face reality, because until we face reality, we can't make any kind of reasonable decision on where we're supposed to go or what we're supposed to do. So we have to face reality. Did we get into the swamp because of something we did in our own lives? Or did we get into the swamp that was totally out of our control? We have to know those things. What's the reality? So, Ezekiel 23, 36 through 39. Let's see if I have that marked here. Oh, I thought I did. Ezekiel, maybe this is it. No. Oh, look, I had marked it. Ezekiel. 23, 36. Moreover, the Lord said to me, Son of man, will you judge Ola on Olaba, then declare to them their abominations? For they have committed adultery, and blood is on their hands. Thus they have committed adultery with their idols, and even caused their sons, whom they bore to me, to pass through the fire to them as food. Again, they have done this to me. They have defiled my sanctuary on the same day, and have profaned my Sabbaths. But when they had slaughtered their children for idols, they entered my sanctuary on the same day to profane it. And lo, thus they did within my house. You should really study what it meant to pass their children through the fire. That's a whole other teaching. Uh, 
How, how do we do these things? How? The same way we deny the menagerie of sins in our own souls and pray for the lost to be saved. The same way we gossip, lie, and envy, and then put out our hands and raise them up and praise the Lord. Pray this prayer if you have the nerve. Lord, open my eyes to see me as you see me. And then, in a river, you'll often come to a roadblock of some kind. This, this I, I'm sure you recognize it right away. This is a log <laughs> in the river. And the log is blocking the flow of the water. The log is blocking the Holy Spirit. So we'll come to roadblocks in this river. You and I, there are roadblocks in front of us. The sunken log. The enemy's attack. Number five. The enemy's attack. I've heard this story more than once. It usually goes something like this. And I have heard, I've heard this in prayer lines also. It usually goes something like this. Joe Christian hears about a group of Christian businessmen that are launching a diamond mine in South Carolina. So he borrows $100,000 to invest because there's going to be a lot of money to be made. Then having spent that prodigious sum in the worthwhile pursuit of proven beyond a doubt, shadow of a doubt that the only diamonds that are in South Carolina are in jewelry stores. He now borrows another 100000 because he just heard about the new oil wells that are being dug and in Israel. He is confident of this because an elder in his brother's church had a word of knowledge about it. Now finding himself $200,000 in debt, his business failing, his wife furious, his children with little hope of ever going to college, ask the church for prayer because he is under satanic attack. <laughs> <clears throat> I would suggest there is a profound difference between being under a satanic attack and being under a stupid attack. <laughs> what to do? Look in the mirror and face the truth. Mm -hmm. Look yourself in the eye and say it out loud, that was stupid. Momentarily, titanically, magnificently, unimaginably stupid. I am not the first man to do anything that dumb and I will not be the last. Now that doesn't that feel better? It cleanses the spirit of a man to strip away all that bright and shining cloud of deceit and false spirituality behind which we'll veil our sheer idiocy. No one enjoys such a wonderful moment, but having done it, you are now in a place where you can find that special divine grace for the stupid and humble that the stupid and proud will never know. Confess the stupidity. Confess that stupid decision. You're where you are because of that. There was a man who was accused of sexual misconduct. It was proven later to be 100% false accusation. Then he was hit by a drunk driver, and he was hospitalized for weeks. Then his wife was diagnosed with cancer. And while they were both in the hospital, their house burnt down. There comes a sobering season of life, and everything you attempt to scramble to dust. Every doorknob has snapped off in your hand. Every tire and all your cars go flat. Here you can legitimately say, now this is a spiritual attack. Sometimes it's impossible to discern whether it's orchestrated satanic attack or the occasional pain of living in a fallen universe. All you know is that you are hurting and you cannot really see where you've been all that stupid. At least no more stupid than usual. And it does not matter all that much whether Satan has planned all of this or if the variables of life all just dipped in at once. Sometimes we have found that in our lives. It seems like everything that could go wrong did go wrong and Satan had nothing to do with it. We feel broken before God. You quit asking why. Because that's what we do a lot. It's not wrong to ask why. But we begin to find God's grace for what to do in this situation. Oh Lord, you pray I'm in a rough place. I know I've said this before, but not like this. This is a full-blown attack. Their tents are many who seek my soul. David said, I know you are the God of valleys. 
So help me in the valley full of enemies. We've all been there, and we'll be there again. And it's okay to pray that way. The enemy loves to pile on the hassles. It's his favorite tactic. Knowing that the little foxes spoil the vines, he will release 10 of them for every Rottweiler that's standing guard. The enemy loves to cause havoc. And then, in the river, after all of this, we may come to a wide place. Now here in this, this very narrow place in the river, we face loss, trials, disappointments. But we've come to a wide place. A wide place in the river. The river doesn't run as fast as it was going. It's kind of calm, it's peaceful. And we come to that place that God allows us to get to, that we can have rest, that we can have refreshment in that, in that calm place, that wide place. Number six, get God's timing on things, not your own timing. This is a story told by Mark Rutland. There was a young man who said that God had revealed to him in a dream that he was to be a crusade evangelist like Billy Graham. He seemed to be earnest and sincere, and nothing about him would make you doubt his account. God can, and he does speak to us in dreams and visions, and, can, and he can and does call young people today to evangelism. But the young man was cautioned to ponder all these things in his heart, like the Virgin Mary, and wait on God's timing. But the counsel was wasted. When the young man told uh, Mark, Rutten, uh, uh, <laughs> Mark Rutland, told him that he rented the Atlantic Civic Center for the next week. This is a true story. All of the caution was angrily blown off as unspiritual, or jealousy, and needlessly discouraging. And so Mark wondered later if he remembered the conversation, the young man. The week at the Civic Center started slow and tapered off. <laughs> 30 the first night, by zero on the final services to an auditorium that could hold thousands. And he was left with the bill. An expensive lesson on timing, but the same taken there, by the same take, token there, are moments when God calls for immediate obedience and later, and later will not call for immediate obedience. What do we do when we believe God has spoken to us about something that <coughs> is rather large, larger than we are? What do we do about that? Probably, if we're smart, we spend some more time in prayer. We consult others who have walked with the Lord for a long time and see what they think about this. So a personal story, in Northern Ireland, uh, I was there on a ministry trip and there was a team of 12 of us and we were taking the train from Dublin to Belfast and then back to Dublin. But, well, and we paid for the train fare. But when we got to Belfast, we were there three, four, five days, I don't remember, and we were going ahead for the train depot to go, go back. The Lord had spoken to me clearly, and the Holy Spirit said, don't take the train. That's all, just don't take the train. Well, we, we've already paid for the train. We can't get our money back now, it's a round trip ticket. So I went to John Halverson, who I was traveling with at the time, and our team, and I told them, we can't take the train. The Holy Spirit said we can't take the train. Pray, luckily, praise God, that John trusted the Holy Spirit in me. We didn't take the train. We went a whole other route. We found a bus and took a whole other route. That night when the 10 o'clock news came on, what do you suppose we heard on the news? The train track had been bombed. The train track had been bombed. Nobody was hurt, but it had been bombed. You see, we don't know what's ahead. But God is up there above and he sees everything that's happening. Amen. So we need to listen. There is one caveat. How do you know when God telling you to go up and win or to wait? How do you know? Well, there's no substitute for maturity. Nothing more maturing than experience. And no way to get experience in a hurry. A New York cab driver, realizing that his fare was John D. Rockefeller, saw his opportunity to get some priceless financial counsel. How can I make good investments, he asked. Wise decisions, was the millionaire's counsel. 
Yes, of course, the cat be coaxed. But how do I make wise decisions? Experience, Rockefeller responded. Well, that's helpful, said the hack, but how do I get that experience? Come on, church. How did Rockefeller respond? Unwise decisions. <laughs> <laughs> Rockefeller explained. That's a fact. That's the truth. There's no shortcut to maturity. Number seven, there's various trials that are going to come up when we walk through, when we're in the Holy Spirit, in the flow. But pass through. We're supposed to pass through. Don't camp there. Mm -hmm. Psalm 84, verses 5 through 6. How blessed is the man whose strength is in thee, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. Pass into the valley of Baca, which is the valley of weeping. They make it a spring or a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with blessings. There are equal up and opposite airs with respect to the Valley of Baca. On the one hand are those particularly irritating faith teachers, so-called, who claim that a true saint has no business in the Valley of Baca, no business weeping tears. No business weeping tears. How many here have wept tears at some time or another while you're walking with the Lord? Amen. <laughs> They claim that a true saint has no business in the Valley of Baca. They're not only boorish, but shallow and superficial. David saw it differently. David wrote that a person who passes through the Valley of Tears is blessed. That remarkable idea flies in the face of modern comfort, obsessed culture or religion, but it definitely is a New Testament view. In 1 Peter 1, 6 through 7, in this you greatly rejoice in, even though now, for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Amen. No, you would say, no modern Christian today has more graphically demonstration of faith purified by fire than Corey Ten Boom. Ravensbrook, concentration camp. After that, every book she wrote, every teaching she gave is through the lessons that she learned. Was it a lack of faith that put her in Ravensbrook? No. Was it sin? No. Sin of others? To be sure. And then when we're in those places is when we ask the question why it comes before the mere fact of the valley and its potential to purify us and fill that up. So the other side of this issue is equally important. While it's true that Christians must occasionally pass through valleys, they must also pass all the way through. How many here have had any times of really hard stuff? <laughs> if you're a Christian and a follower of Christ, you have and will yet again quite possibly. The besetting sin in the Valley of Baca is self-pity. Tempted to wallow in our sorrows, we tend to camp where we should not. We need to pass through the Valley of Baca. It's no shame and no sign of weakness, but we need to pass through and let time and grace and God do his work. Some who go into the Valley of Baca never come out because they refuse to let go of the pain from there. It becomes first a part of them, then finally their very definition of who they are. They can't imagine a life without that pain. I, but we need to do this. When we're in that place, we need to say, I will come out of this. I will come out of this. There is an end of this for me. I am not my pain. Speak it with every tear of agony. Speak it with every step taken. But say it all the same. I am in this valley now. I will not live in denial, but I will come out on the other side. Amen. Worship team can come up, come up. So as we follow the living river of the Holy Spirit, let us remember this. In Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and yes and forever. And Philippians 3, 14, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. 
How many here are pressing on through whatever it is you're walking through, but you're pressing through it? You are not sitting in it. You are not hanging out in it. You're not going to build your house there or set a camp there. How many? We all have stuff. But we need to press on. Holy Spirit is taking us through. This is life. Amen. We are in life. We do not, we're not of the world, but we are in the world. We're living in a terrible place. And we're living at a very difficult time. But you know what? God has called each one of us to this time. Amen. It's not by accident that we're living here at this time. Because God's got a plan and a purpose in each one of our lives to be at this place at this time. And I believe also in this church, and there are some that are not here today that are part of the church, but that we're called for a purpose. And that's what we're going to be looking at and we're going to be talking about next week. So, how are you doing out there? How is your river flowing? <clears throat> how, listen carefully now, how is your, li your liver? <laughs> <laughs> How is your liver doing? How is your river flowing? Now, if I said, well, it's at 10% capacity or 50% or 70% or 100%, what would you say? How is your river flowing? It's going. It's going. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. You don't, have, don't want to even... 100%. Praise the Lord. That's a good thing. Anybody else? What? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Some days we get uh, we get stopped, don't we? But but our God has never changed. Amen. And our God has not changed his mind about what he's called you to or to this church to. Amen. Praise Amen. the Lord for that. Amen. So we're staying strong and we press on. Amen. 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 God bless you out there that were with us through this whole morning. We love you, and we pray for you regularly. God bless. Let's close in worship. Say, so Pastor, could I share a dream I had about the river? Behind me. Sure. Back in the mid-90s, I had a dream, and it was a very vivid dream, and I know it was a spiritual dream because of the contents that it had in it. And it was, I came to a place where there was a river, and it was a very wide river. And the Lord was telling me to step into the river. And I stepped into the river, and it was ankle deep. And he said, keep going. Keep walking. Keep walking into the midst of the river. And I thought for sure I would be up over my neck before long. But I walked a great distance. And then the river was to my knees. And the most the river ever got was to my waist. And then I was upon a sandbar out in the midst of the river. And what it is, is God was telling me that you need to trust in me and obey me. And the reason why the river would never overtake us or overcome us is God has given us free will. And he wants us to willingly lay ourselves down mm -hmm. into the river to be submerged, to be cleansed, to be purified. So I just wanted to share that with you because when I heard your message, Pastor, it just brought that to my remembrance. And it's those times that we have with the Lord, those dreams, those visions, those encounters with God. Those are treasures. Yes. Amen? Amen? So thank you. Amen.